Oh no, Fraser's frozen for me. I see him just fine. Fraser's fine. I will let you know if anyone freezes. Can all you right. hear me though, Morgan? Yes, I hear you. Okay, all right. And just imagine I'm moving around animatedly as opposed to... You know what? I don't even recommend you look at it. You just move this window away and just don't think about it. Just listen right. and let I, the voices come I can't come see it anyway. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, so this is so this is fun. So so we did a conversation about the future of the International Space Station on our on our Discord channel, which is sort of a new thingy we're trying to figure out. And Justin, I guess through Kismet, saw this and jumped in and provided a ton of value, which was awesome. So now I've got like a better sense of of what he's seen and done and where he's coming from. But it was a it was a lot of fun to to have. That's what I kind of like about these like clubhouse i don't did any of you ever try clubhouse like one time one time yeah i mean mostly it's just people talking about nfts and crypto but occasionally oh, yeah yeah but occasionally it's it's sort of a fun chance for people to talk with each other and so discord has everyone now has rolled out their version twitter has their spaces i think and and discord has their version of it i don't even know what it's called hangouts Wait, maybe that's Wait, what we that's called Google. it. Wait, that's Google. Yeah, no, it's I think that's Google. what we called it. We called it a hangout. I don't even know mm -hmm. what they call it. An event? Anyway. Um, but in theory, it lets people come and, and, and talk. And nobody was talking. And then Justin put his hand up. And then I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Who's this? And uh, and then we had a great conversation with the International Space Station. So it was a lot An of fun. An interloper. And it was, yeah, the best kind of interloper. Yeah, it was perfect. Um, <sighs> what else? uh we're about a three weeks away now from getting our shop complete and not living in the trailer hell yay yay how excited are you very cool oh 12 yeah <laughs> yeah i'm incredibly excited although now that we're into spring the living isn't so difficult mm. as it as it was through the dead of winter and we were you know peeling ice off outside. the interior walls of the trailer and Oh dear. You know, oh yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Digging through four feet of snow. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it was a tough winter. Apparently, the people yeah. higher up on the, on the mountain where I live, and like most winters, they see no snow and they, they saw 12 feet of snow. So four meters of snow this year. That's and crazy. They'd never seen anything like it. Like people had to leave their houses because they were, they couldn't function anymore. So they had to go and find some other place to live. It was so crazy. Yeah, what a what a winter. That's but that's crazy. it. The rest of our weather and temperature from here on out is going to be perfectly normal. 
Sure. Now you can see. <laughs> oh, no, no. Next three weeks. What are you going to see? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, global warming. Yes. I Well, we only have, I think, three weeks left of construction on our house, which I'm looking forward to being done. Wow. Yeah. That, I'm in my temporary office space on my dining room table like it's March mm -hmm. 2020 again. Yep. Um, yeah, because anyway, there's renovations going on and I'm still working from home and it is... Very That's stressful. exciting. I didn't know Very you guys were building. Stressful. That's exciting. Uh, not so much building so much as completely gutting our second floor mm. and rebuilding it into something better, which That's is not awesome. hard the to do. kind of building when you can hear the sawing over your head all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 When they show up every morning and do work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Least... yeah. Yeah. They show up very early in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. At least I can't hear them unless they're <laughs> banging around outside or running yeah. excavators. So, all right. Unless We've reached the mark so let's get started justin you're gonna stick around for the whole show so feel free to jump in and join the conversation at any point on any topic that absolutely fascinates you like magnetic lines shutting down conversions of neutron stars into black holes um, or my browser <laughs> yeah um but uh yeah and so but we'll start with the you'll be interviewed first and then we'll move on to the rest of the of the show all right here we go great Glad to be here. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, April 6th, 2022. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about NASA's ongoing telescope name problem. Amazon buys all the flights, Pluto's cryovolcanoes, neutron stars becoming black holes, and tiny galaxies with supermassive black holes. Joining me this week... We've got on my screen, who's first? We got Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Hey, Kimberly. Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day. Happy podcast day to you, too. We got Dr. Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. Happy April. Happy. <laughs> we just can't follow Kimberly's no, it's, awesome. It's impossible. It's un it is. undoable. Yeah, it's done. She's, sorry, it's a, not it's sorry. a legacy. Yeah, exactly. And we've got uh, Leah Jenks. Leah, welcome back. Hi, Fraser. Good to be here. I was going to say happy Wednesday. But happy Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Now we're all just like coming up with our own buzzwords to try and keep up with Kimberly and it's hopeless. All right. Now, before we get into this week's special guest, I want to give a huge shout out to our good friends, fans of the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are the ones who organize everything behind the scenes, including all the guests, all the co-hosts, who shows up, when, where, what do we do? And we couldn't do this without them. So if you want this kind of ultimate cosmic power to really control the very actions of all of us, go to the WSHcrew.space. That's the amazing community. They'll hook you up, give you all the tools that you need. So definitely join that community. And especially when the hiatus comes in, oh, I don't know, like three months, four months. So you want some people to, to hang out with while you wait for the news to return. All right, let's get into this week's interview. We've got Dr. Justin Walsh. Justin, welcome to the Weekly Space Account. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So the question I always ask people is, who are you? What do you do? Oh, uh, no. Um, so my name is Justin Walsh. I am an archaeologist and uh, also an art historian. I started by doing Greek archaeology but made my way into space archaeology in the last 15 years or so. And I am co-PI of the International Space Station Archaeological Project, which uh, since 2015 has been examining ISS as an archaeological site. It's awesome that, that we have been flying in space for so long that it is now a, like archaeologists can start to think about, about this history. It's incredible. Especially, you know, ISS being inhabited for 21 plus years con continuously, right? I mean, that's that's really, you know, set the standard. And um, is, what can we say? It's the first permanent habitat in space, right? So, so where did this idea come from to treat the International Space Station as a, a human habitat that needs to be studied with the tools of archaeology? So I actually came at this from the angle of heritage, as I think a lot of my, uh, my colleagues who are doing space archaeology did as well. Um, I, I was working at an archaeological site in Sicily uh, during my 
the period when I was doing my dissertation research, and we would see fresh holes in the ground um, from time to time where local folks were trying to make ends meet by finding objects that they could sell, which would end up in major actual private and public collections like the Metropolitan Museum of Art or whatever. Um, and so that, that issue of protecting heritage was really important to me. When I started teaching, I taught a course on cultural heritage and a student raised her hand and said, that stuff in space is that heritage. And like the light bulb went on <laughs> for me at that point. And it was like, I'd never thought of that. But as soon as I did think about it, it's like, yes, of course, you know, you think about a place like Tranquility Base and it's hard to imagine actually a site that would be more culturally or historically yeah. significant. And that's, there's plenty of items there that archeologists could go and reconstruct the quote unquote Apollo culture as my colleague PJ Catalotti has, has called it. Um, and understand the scientific technology today, but also, you know, that it was coming out of this competitive uh, Cold War kind of uh, context, and also a masculine context, if we can compare it to like ISS, which is multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-gender, et cetera. So we can actually talk about different kinds of cultures. But then the idea of how to actually do it in practical terms, that seemed really hard. We were all doing these kind of theoretical studies, like how would you protect this if you could protect it? And what about the international aspects of space? Uh, how does that affect trying to protect it if you know the US can't say, oh, this is a national historic site? And uh, I was uh, happening, happened to be following on Twitter in 2015 and saw their call for new astronaut candidates at that time and looked at the, the, the actual advertisement. And it said, if you're a social scientist, you cannot apply to be an astronaut. And in parentheses, it said, yeah, no, really. And in parentheses, it said, geography, anthropology, archaeology. And I thought, like, oh. how is it possible? First of all, I could not believe that we were even on their radar enough <laughs> to merit, <laughs> to, to merit being to prohibited. To specifically make sure that none, none of you show up. Exactly, exactly. And then on top of that, it was like, but why? You know, if you want to do a three-year mission to Mars, don't you want to understand the the micro society that the the crew creates and the culture that they create to structure that society yeah. you know there's been obviously decades of biomedical and, and psychological research in these issues right from the beginning uh, but the social cultural aspect of it is really understudied so i started thinking how could i show um how could i show the utility of our perspective how could i let them understand what they were missing out on and i was also reading a book by a colleague um Called, his name is Jason DeLeon, and the book is called uh, Land of Open Graves. It's absolutely fabulous about what he was doing with the undocumented migration project, where he was developing new anthropological and archaeological techniques to understand the movement of migrants across the U.S.-Mexico border. And one of the things he did was he gave migrants disposable cameras on the Mexico side of the border, and oh, he picked I've them up about this. on, the, on yeah. the U.S. side of the border. And he won a MacArthur Genius Prize for this. This is incredible yes. work. Um, but that allowed him to, uh, and I see I've frozen now, but I, I'm hoping you can still hear me. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, hear we can me? hear you. Okay, we'll keep going like this. So, um, yeah, so, he, so he was able to observe things that he couldn't observe in person. And that idea of using the photography was like, okay, now I have a way to access this society as you're seeing on screen, you know, you can see the, the, the image of, uh, a photograph of a Russian module and all the things on the walls. How, if we can take all of those photographs, the thousands and thousands of digital photographs that are that are available of ISS, and we can capture who's in each photo, and where they're located, and all the items that are they're associated with, and use the metadata from the photos to capture their time and their their date. Uh, we can put them in order, and we could actually chart out the entire arc of behavior and meanings cultural meanings across ISS's whole history. So that was kind of how we got started. I reached out to my colleague, Alice Gorman at Flinders University in Australia. She agreed to do this project with me. And that's that's really where this came from. Uh, if you go to the, the next slide, you'll see just how one of these areas can change over time. It's kind of a GIF, so it'll just run, but see this, this one area. And if you just look at that wall behind the crew, you'll see all different kinds of items. It didn't stay static. Right, that was something that we we were able to recognize and capture and charge and and for the first time say like what's the meaning of this cultural landscape? 
Absolutely fascinating. So then I guess, you know, one of the downsides of, of this site is that it is flying hundreds of kilometers overhead. And uh, since NASA is clearly not going to let, you know, archaeologists fly to the space station, how will you study it? Right. So we also can't afford the $55 million that it would cost to, to do a private flight to ISS, unfortunately. Right. But um, yeah, so the idea is to do this remotely. If we can't go in person, what are the ways that we can do this? Um, and so we've developed various techniques. So using these historic photos is one. But most recently, we were able to convince the ISS National Lab to allow us to do an actual experiment on ISS, which we call the Sampling Quadrangle Assemblages Research Experiment, which is a really silly name, but it gets us the acronym SQUARE. And if we can look at um, the, the slide that has the dirt on it, then, um, then I could kind of explain what we were doing here. Uh, so essentially, what we're, what we're doing is taking one of the most basic archaeological techniques on Earth, what we call the shovel test pit. And the idea essentially is that um, if, if you go to a new site, you don't know what you're going to find. You divide up the site into a grid of squares, one, usually one meter by one meter, so you can dig them quickly. And you just choose some random squares, exactly like you see on the screen. You, and you do one meter by one meter, right? And you, that allows you to sample the site and get a sense for what your strategy should be going hmm. forward, right? So we're applying this exact idea to ISS. And it, essentially what we've done is we've selected five sample locations in different modules of the space station. And we've asked them to be marked out as one meter by one meter squares. Um, the crew also chose a location. We asked them to do that because we thought who else would have a great idea of what kinds of areas what might be interesting for us to look at. So we chose um, science areas and maintenance areas and also you know, a, a, a leisure area like the node one gap as you're seeing here, this is Kayla Barron actually taking a photograph of one of the squares. The square in this image is actually mostly on the, the, the right end of the photo. You might be able to see a yellow piece of tape up in the corner there at the galley. And that kind of marks out this area, just taking pictures of the walls once a day, every day for 60 days. And doing that for these six areas, we're able to see incremental change over time and to understand not just what is expected to be happening, as you see in this photograph of uh, node one, or node two, excuse me, the workstation, starboard workstation in node two, um, that we put just L's of tape at the corner, but we're that those mark kind of the boundaries of our sample area. And that, that, that allows us to see not only, as I say, you know, the kind of expected activity that you would find in the galley would be eating or here would be maintenance, but unexpected kinds of activity too. So there's a, an image of this that's, uh, I think it's the next one, um, where you would see, uh, yes, this incredible, <laughs> this incredible image of a glove bag that was being used for um, a, a study of concrete. Yeah, how does mm -hmm. concrete set, set in space? Um, and I just think, love this picture because it looks like one of those prehistoric transparent deep sea fish <laughs> with the light shining through it and the glove, gloves are like uh, the eyes of the fish. But this shows us that this maintenance area is also used for science, like it's multifunctional. Or the galley area is also used for reading because we can actually see that there are e-books or physical books in them. In this example of the galley, uh, what you see kind of the tubes in the upper right and center right are actually tubes of cake frosting. So they were cooking here as well. And that cooking is a really hard thing to do in space. So we're getting windows into, in other words, the multifunctionality of these spaces, the ways in which they're used uh, in th that they were designed for, really. And that's what we, that's kind of what we hope to bring out in this study. And, and I think that's where you might get NASA's ears really perking up again, is, is to see the astronauts essentially developing a culture on board the station. This is where we eat, but also where we read. And this is what happens after someone goes to the bathroom. This is how we all behave. That that these lessons can then be fed back into their designs for future spacecraft, future stations, future moon bases to, to make this process easier. I mean, you know, whenever you have, like whenever you go camping or for example, when you 
live in a trailer um you spaces get used for a bunch of things all at the same time in many cases you had no plan that that's what you were going to use that space for our bathroom is also our um our garden for our for all of our <laughs> um tropical plants while the uh well our kitchen table is the garden for the for the other plants that i can just imagine nasa being incredibly interested in what you have to tell them what what lessons you're going to learn from what this this culture has developed but someone actually studying it as opposed to it just being so ephemeral and then being gone you 100 percent hit the nail on the head um that's that's what our ultimate goal is it, it's kind of you know this i know this project when you first hear about it, like you're doing archaeology in space that's so it's such a kind of a fantasy sort of thing that it's like what could that even be but maybe weirdly this very unusual archaeological project can have the practical outcome of helping not only nasa and other space agencies design future space habitats better but also the various corporate commercial operators that want to produce um, space habitats, right? Like they want to know what's the best way to do this? What's the most, what lessons can we learn from ISS? Because surely after all this time, we should be learning lessons from it. And yet the thing that they, they haven't been able to do is develop data that can truly help them to do that. That's where we come in. Like the archeological perspective is who's using what part of the site or you know, how do we, how do we make uh, space our space? Or how do we have privacy in a space? Th those are all key issues for living in space. In, this, in the case of uh, the Zvezda module, what you're looking at here, this was this early pilot study that we did. Look at how that wall behind the crew is being used to send messages about who the, you know, the cosmonauts are that are, that are um, living in this space. That's not a space that was designed for this. That's a space that they have opportunistically taken over and, and made into their own. So like, what if you, from the beginning and designing a space habitat, accommodated those ideas, accommodated those desires and needs of the crew? I think you'd have a happier crew, which yeah. would probably make them a, a healthier crew and a, a, a more functional crew, right? So this is where we, we do hope to have some impacts. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, so how how does this end then? When will you be gathering your data and providing your final report? Uh, I don't want to put a date on it at the moment because nobody's ever tried to capture this kind of data from this this kind of evidence before. Uh, but the so the actual um, photos happened between I think it was January twenty first and March twenty second. Um, and so we've got all those images. We have 358 of them from the six different locations. And we are currently, Alice and I, we have a web tool that was developed by a graduate student at Carleton University in Ottawa um, that uh, helps us to draw boxes around each item and then we can label them. So we capture both the location and the type of item it is and its various characteristics. And then we're gonna do a statistical analysis of that. What I, you know, how are items moving around from day to day? What items are appearing in different locations? Can we even identify where an item moves from one location to another? There's anecdotal stuff that I can tell you about that we discovered. You know, like I said, you know, the the, the cooking or reading in the galley, like how can that be accommodated? Or or the different uses of the node two workstation? Or how do we see, for example, hospitality uh, represented? We saw it actually even after the invasion of Ukraine the crew does a traditional Friday night dinner where all of them get together. And we saw evidence clearly in the galley that that was still going on because in the US galley on the table, there was actually a, a large ginger, Russian gingerbread pastry that was there. And it was there on a Saturday. It appeared on a Saturday on the table. So it was like, the Russians brought this. And this is like, that's hospitality too. Like yeah. you bring something to a party, right? To be seen as a good guest. And then it was there. And then it started to get picked at over the following days and like it shrank and then it disappeared <laughs> so like, it was clearly russian because it had a russian label on it and it actually had, had been molded with the name of energia the the russian state uh, uh company that builds all the rockets so that that was clear like they're still getting together in the way that they did that's and so in a, in a sense they're kind of overcoming the conflict on earth living and working together and they have to do that that's not surprising but that's the kind of evidence that we see yeah. how long is it going to take us to that data well, certainly months, uh, but we're working as quickly as we can.
Absolutely fascinating. I got a couple of questions that that came in that I thought would be interesting. Uh, Nancy Graziano, our producer, asks, uh, were you given access to multinational areas of ISS or was it strictly the U.S. model? We tried to get everything we because we are interested in the, an ISS. We're not interested just in the U.S. segment. We were told from the beginning that getting Russian access to the Russian spaces was a non-starter, but we did have a square in each of the Japanese experiment module, Kibo, and in the Columbus module. So we did try and cover that as much as possible. And each, there were six squares, there were six they, that were in six modules. Hmm. So we covered as much of the U.S. segment as we could. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't get the Russian side. Right. Yeah, understood. All right. Well, um, you're going to stick around for the show, but I want to give you a chance to let people know where they can find your work and, and keep track of this story as it unfolds. So what's what's the best place to go? Well, you can see on the screen, issarchaeology.org is our website. It has a blog where we've been posting various articles. There are at least three articles up now up just about the Square project, so you can check that out. Um, and then we're pretty active on Twitter, probably unnecessarily active, but it's at issarchaeology. So we would love to, to, um, to connect with people there. Perfect. Well, fantastic, Justin. Thank you. Um, and I'm not sure if, if you need to reload again or if... Because are you all seeing Justin yes, please frozen? Please reload. Please reload. Yeah. Okay. But you're. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. Sorry. And come back. We'll... Um. All right. And while while Justin reloads, while the question mark uh, resolves, uh, let's move on to this week's news. <clears throat> Morgan, let's let's have a uh, let's have an update on uh, space constellations. Yeah. If you've got a medium or heavy lift rocket to to sell then then jeff bezos is buying um in fact he's already bought um it came out this week that amazon has signed uh contracts for up to 83 rocket launches on three next generation medium and heavy lift rockets uh to launch elements of their project kuiper um constellation which is a competitor to the spacex star uh starlink system and based on their filings uh, with the F FCC, they're projecting or promising that they're going to launch more than 3,000 satellites in the coming years, um, except they don't have a rocket. And so they kind of had to go out shopping for for rockets. And their approach has been sort of them all. So they bought launches on the next generation UL ULA rocket, the Vulcan, the next generation uh, Ariane 6, and then of course on the Blue Origin um, uh, new uh, new Glenn rocket as as well. And so there's more than a dozen launches guaranteed basically on each of those, and then many more on, on some of the systems. Well, that sounds and, fantastic. And how many of those rockets are flying? Yeah, you might, you might recognize that those rockets have combined for a grand total of zero launches and uh, zero tests effectively um, since um, since their development started. And so this is sort of a huge risk for, for Amazon to take. The one name you might notice that they're not buying launches on is, is SpaceX. And the evidence suggests that that's probably more likely than not because uh, Amazon wasn't asking, uh, because SpaceX is very happily launching for the third competing constellation system being managed out of Europe, which is OneWeb. And so it seems pretty clear that SpaceX is sort of, they'll take your money and launch um, your, your payload. Uh, but Amazon is obviously not interested in funneling money directly to a, a competitor. Not yet. I wonder, so they will, has, has SpaceX, I mean, I'm sure SpaceX will take their money. I mean, they're going to be launching. They're going to launch the OneWeb satellite. So I can't see why they wouldn't launch. Yeah, exactly. The I think satellites. It, this seems evidence that Amazon is not not buying. Uh, is basically the direction this is going. Uh, but this is a real serious injection of money into these nascent systems. I think one estimate was like ten billion dollars is maybe the aggregate value of of all these launches. And so, if you're a company trying to kind of get going. Uh, with this next rocket, having all those customers lined up is is a is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a big bet on 
on the Blue Origin rocket engine, which is powering uh, two thirds of those rockets and an engine that has not yet flown at all. And so, you know, they've delivered the first uh, rocket sample engine samples to ULA for the Vulcan engine, but it hasn't fired other than on a test stand uh, to to this point. So if a problem were to crop up, that would wipe out three quarters of all of these uh, scheduled launches in, in the next couple of years. But when you look at the relationships involved here, right, you've got like Jeff Bezos, who founded Blue Origin, also founded Amazon. They're going to have a relationship. Blue Origin is providing the rocket engines, the the BE fours, both for the for the the new Glenn and also for the Vulcan. That's that's a lot riding on this one company's hardware that seems kind of infinitely delayed i yeah it's a it's a big question mark and i think yeah. the other big question mark that really nobody's been able to answer yet is the economics of this i mean mm -hmm. i think i saw one estimate that spacex is probably launching starlink satellites for like a third as much in cost as there as you would be able to purchase a launch from say ula or Somebody. And if mm. you're paying sort of, and we know that these satellite systems are going to require basically infinite launches, right? Because every, you know, by the time you've launched 3000 satellites, a whole bunch of them has, have fallen out of orbit uh, because they've either been deorbited on purpose or they stopped working, you know, drag, dra drag part of the world. And so if your fundamental unit of operational expense is three times higher than that of your competitor yeah how exactly where are you cheaper that is going to allow you to make those economies make sense and so yeah. i think that's kind of the question that isn't really clear here is if if you're not spacex how do you make money doing this and the these deals suggest that the answer might be sort of you have to self-deal one way or the other and so, you know, SpaceX is fully integrated in doing it. Amazon is looking to fun, funnel money to the systems that are using their sort of sister rocket, or their, at least their sister engine. And over time, that may also serve to drive down uh, the costs. Because if you can't get your launch costs to be comparable to SpaceX, it's just, to me, I don't understand how you're going to be a competitive um, entry into this field. And we could be two months away from SpaceX making itself obsolete with the launch of Starship, which c should bring down launch cap costs by at least one order of magnitude, maybe two. And and yet the the Vulcan, the the New Glenn and the Ariane six are all old school, partially reusable rockets. At least it's a it's a step forward, but. Yeah, and like, while is the, is the is the plan to hope to expect that Musk is going to fail on this, that SpaceX is going to fail in getting Starship to fly? It, yeah, it's hard to know what the sort of the business sense here is. Obviously, um, in most markets, you can sustain multiple com competing services, but there isn't usually such a fundamental mismatch in the cost of providing that that service. And on the rocket side, I think, I think this is unequivocally is a good thing for Arian Space and for ULA. I mean, this is money in the bank, yeah. launches locked down. But at the cadence these companies have operated on in, say, the past decade, this is every launch with these companies for a number of years. And it's coming online right when, as you say, Starship is going to begin to enter the market potentially. And so what this means is if you're any company not named Amazon looking to launch something in the next five years, and you're not willing to launch it in China or in Russia, you're going to go to SpaceX because they're the only ones that have capacity. Amazon's basically bought out everyone else. Yeah. And so that next generation of relationships is going to be formed based on the relationship between these companies and, and SpaceX. And the expectations of those launches potentially will be formed based on the capabilities of Starship or at least the cadence and capabilities of, say, Falcon Heavy. And so these companies are kind of making it 
this mega deal with Amazon, which is going to guarantee them a lot of revenue and a lot of operational success, hopefully, in the next years. I think there's a, a view on this where down the road, we see this as the chance for SpaceX to kind of monopolize everyone else without even doing anything, right? Yeah. By being the only game left in town, everybody's going to have to come uh, to them. Do we have a sense of, of how much they're paying for these flights? It, none of these deals have public um, public numbers. All we really know is that the past, so you look at Ariane 5 or you look at Atlas 5, those were launches that were generally, I'm going to say, were in excess of $100 million. And for Vulcan and Ariane 6, the goal was to be cheaper. It was not to be more powerful necessarily. It was to be cheaper. And so we can expect that less than that is probably right, at least once they reach their final operational cadence. But that's a far cry from the estimates we've seen for the cost to SpaceX to launch a reused Falcon 9. That, I mean, I've seen numbers as low as, you know, in the low tens of millions of dollars to do that. And no, no, none of these other rockets are realistically going to operate at less than $100 million in the near future. Uh, and so even if SpaceX is spending $40 million to launch a reused Falcon 9, that's less than half, I think you can yeah. say pretty safely, than what these other companies are, are going to be able to do. And then SpaceX is doing it for free, basically, for themselves. So it's really just the, the no-profit cost to get that satellite um, ecosystem up there. And I, it's just hard for me to see how that's going to, to change. Yeah. Yeah, I don't get it. I just, I literally, this just does not make any sense to me at all. Like, if you want to launch a Constellation, go with SpaceX. They're lo they have rockets now that have launched 10 times, 12 times. Um, their costs, as you said, are in the low tens of millions. Yeah, I mean, you can see why, flights. you can see why a competitor wouldn't want to do that, right? Because SpaceX is going to charge Amazon 60 million. And that's of kind course. of, that's not an, and that's not, that's a reasonable number. That's what they're charging NASA to do things. And that difference of say 20 or 30 million between their real costs and what they're charging Amazon, that's enough money to launch another uh, <laughs> round of, of Starlink. So you're just paying your competitor to yeah. expand even faster. And yep. so I think these, I mean, as consumers, we should want competition in a field like this. As people who like looking at the sky, maybe we shouldn't. But yeah. either way, um, I think these companies are in a hard place. And I don't know kind of what the right answer yeah. for that well, is. And, and, and fair disclosure, I'm recording this from Starlink, using Starlink right now. So uh, I, you know, as a, as a customer, it's fine. It works. It does the job. It's... It's fast download speeds. I can live in the Canadian forest and still do my job as a internet journalist. So, uh, like, SpaceX has already jumped all the way to to having this whole system up and running and and a high cadence, and they've they've worked out most of the kinks. And now it's a matter of of setting this up. It uh, and to then try to come mul several years afterwards to set up an also ran on a launch system. Okay. You know what? We could just do this forever. Um, so thank you, Morgan. <laughs> Let's move on. Kimberly. Yeah. I'm, I'm fully aware that you and Morgan could go on and on about SpaceX for hours. <laughs> um, fascinating though, it is to listen to. I always learn so much listening to you guys talk about the, the rocket market right now. Um, in other news, uh, we talk a lot on this show about the James Webb Space Telescope and all of the amazing science discoveries that it is going to make and the amazing calibration images it has released in the past couple weeks. Um, unfortunately, the telescope has been making headlines for less pleasant reasons, but equally important reasons. And that has to do with the name of the telescope itself. Please, I apologize for the sneezing cat in the background. I thought that was just the 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 nope. hammering of the. Nope, that is yeah, my. Oh that my is god! My someone's cat. going beating down your ceiling. He has allergies. Apologies. Um, Poor kitty. Yes. 
Um, the name of the telescope, obviously, it's named after former NASA Administrator James Webb, who was the NASA Administrator during the Apollo era. Uh, before that, he was uh, second in command in the State Department during the Truman Administration, uh, and in particular during a time known as the Lavender Scare, in which uh, there was a purge of federal employees who were gay and lesbian. Uh, and this has been public knowledge since the 1950s that this has been going on, uh, that this went on in the 1950s and the 1960s and going onwards. Um, and I mean, for a while, no one really brought it up. Um, but for the past few years, uh, ahead of the launch of the telescope back in December, there uh, has been a small and growing and vocal group of astronomers and members of the LGBTQ community who have very understandably had a problem with this telescope that is going to represent the next decades, this next generation of space exploration being named after a problematic figure like James Webb. Uh, and so this group of astronomers has put together petitions, has talked to the members of the astronomy community, has been putting pressure on NASA to change the name of the telescope away from a figure who discriminated against uh, LGBTQ NASA employees and astronomers uh, and to name it something that represents the bold and inclusive and uh, brighter future that this telescope represents. Uh, for many years, NASA did nothing, ignored them, uh, until last year uh, when uh, the petitions and the pressure put on NASA got uh, strong enough that NASA decided that it was going to do an internal investigation to see if there was any merit in the accusations against James Webb, to see uh, if there was enough evidence uh, that he was a problematic enough figure that they should change the name of the telescope before launch. Uh, many people uh, were very happy to hear that NASA was taking this more seriously. Uh, I was, full disclosure, I was among those people who was very happy to hear that NASA was taking steps to possibly address this problem. Uh, and after they announced that they were going to investigate, uh, there was no news about such investigation for a very long time. And then out of the blue, uh, NASA, current NASA Administrator Bill Nelson sent a one-sentence statement to six journalists saying that NASA had found no evidence supporting the need to change the name of the telescope and that they weren't going to do it. And that was September of last year. Problem uh, solved. Moving on. Well, no. <laughs> Very much no, because none of this follows any sort of standard NASA policy. Uh, the fact that the administrator released no report and no explanation for the decision did not consult the internal NASA committee that was still investigating the matter before he released the statement. And the fact that it wasn't an official NASA statement, but instead a personal statement by the administrator to select journalists, not a public announcement, but to select journalists with no warning, none of that is standard. None of that is how it's supposed to work. And certainly not for a matter that many in the community considered incredibly important, uh, not just to them, but to the entire uh, world who have been looking to this telescope for decades uh, to basically signal the direction that we wanted astronomy and space exploration to go. So uh, enterprising journalists being the curious creatures that we are, uh, didn't leave the matter at that. This is uh, the most amazing part. It's, well, uh, this is what investigative journalists do. They file Freedom of Information Act requests, which is exactly uh, what Alexander Witsey at Nature did uh, and just recently published over 400 pages of internal NASA emails obtained through the Freedom of Information Act that reveal what was actually going on behind the scenes at NASA during this these months of silence between NASA saying they were going to investigate and Bill Nelson's out of the blue statement that no evidence was found. These documents 
uh, all these emails reveal that yes, information was found, evidence was found uh, in, these are internal NASA documents uh, in their archives showing that while uh, it may not have been an official NASA policy during James Webb's tenure to discriminate and fire gay and lesbian employees, it certainly was an unwritten rule. It was certainly was an unwritten understanding that that's what the policy was. And while the name Clifford Norton uh, has certainly come up a lot uh, as one of the employees who was interrogated for hours and fired for being gay, um, while his name has come up a lot, he certainly wasn't an isolated case during James Webb's tenure. These documents also show that NASA has been aware of this problem for a very long time. And the, the fact that James Webb is problematic. There were internal discussions about what to do. And it seemed like at every step along the way, they were trying to shoehorn the information they had in their own archives, as well as what information had been coming in from an external historian that they hired. They've been trying to shoehorn this evidence into a pre-made decision to not rename the telescope. And then keep all of that information from anyone who was asking about it. Uh, these people include um, an internal NASA committee who was supposed to be addressing the matter, who was working with the NASA historian and the external historian, uh, the, a committee from the American Astronomical Society who were looking into this very closely, journalists who were looking into this very closely, as well as the original group of astronomers who had raised this issue uh, to the point that it was being investigated. So now all of that information is public. The fact that not only did NASA know about the problem, they were trying to cover up the problem and lie to people who cared about the problem in order to justify a decision that they'd already made. Yes. Yes. So this is, a, so that's, that's what's been going on. Um, and there's been some wonderful journalist pieces exploring the, the and untangling the, the threads and the, the spider web of what has been going on behind the scenes. Um, none of it is particularly pleasant to hear about or to listen, listen to. Um, however, um, there has been, because of this, renewed pressure on NASA to, I don't want to say reopen the investigation because it never actually closed, but to continue the investigation, to make the results of the investigation uh, public as it's going on, mm -hmm. and renewed pressure to rename the telescope to a, something that is not problematic, include a significant fraction of the astronomy community and the worldwide community who cares about space. So what happens next? <sighs> well, what happens next is probably more waiting, unfortunately. The investigation is ongoing. People are still, uh, external people, journalists, historians are still looking into it. Um, now that COVID restrictions in the U.S. are easing for good or ill, um, access to presidential archives is now available. So not only will historians have access to the NASA archives, but also to the Truman archives or archives from the Truman presidency to investigate the full scope of how James Webb may have been involved in the La Lavender Scare. So all of that will provide much more uh, information as to, you know, I don't want to say how bad the problem is because it's already bad, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, the more evidence that is accrued, the more pressure can be put on to change the name of the telescope, um, either back to what it was called before, which is just the Next Generation Space Telescope, which is a perfectly fine name, um, or to something more revolutionary, like has been proposed, like the Harriet Tubman Space Telescope, like, which is I my like personal that suggestion. vote. I love it's mine too because uh, I saw that. But if I yeah, vote, that great conversation where that was, you know, she teach taught people to use the North Star as a way to guide themselves north. And absolutely, uh, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, so so I mean, I, I think we have to wait and see how this goes i think the i mean just it's heartbreaking to hear that all this information had to be brought out 
through a Freedom of Information Act. It, it yeah. feels like as an agency, NASA is one of those agencies that is incredibly transparent and does a really good job of communicating its thoughts and ideas with the public more than almost any other agency out there. And to then have this sort of get dumped on us thanks to you know one journalist finally doing the work is is really frustrating and and you know i mean again we could opine for hours just about what it should be named and go into this discussion about is it right to go back and name things and so on and so forth but it's just like to not even know what was going on makes me really mad to not even know and to and i agree i think a lot of the feelings towards NASA regarding this issue, our sadness, our disappointment, yeah. our anger and frustration uh, at them keeping information, not just keeping information from the public that the public has explicitly asked for, but lying about it and saying something explicitly untrue uh, in order to justify a decision that they'd already made. Yeah. Um, as far as renaming the telescope goes, it wouldn't be the first time that NASA has renamed a telescope after it has launched. Yes, and they have even, to rebrand the websites and the logos and whatever. But in terms of in yeah. relation to the cost of the telescope, it's negligible. Um, there's no reason not to do it and plenty of reasons to do it. And even if they didn't do it, at least have the bravery to have a conversation in the public. The, the reason they had the conversation in private was because they knew it wasn't going to make them look good. And the reason it didn't make them look good was because they were probably taking the wrong actions. So absolutely. So, so let's just and like just have this conversation this, and have the voices get in. Also, also keep in mind the t the time frame that this was happening in 2020 and 2021 when NASA was going out of its way to acknowledge hidden figures in its past. Yeah. The same but I mean, that was a that. different time back then in 2020, Kimberly. You know. Oh yes, <laughs> it was so long ago. <laughs> it was so long. Clearly, we can't we can't judge people in 2020 by the morals that we have today. All right. Well, I, I'm we're running out of time. And and like I said, I think we could, you know, we could rabbit hole this pretty deep. But um, happy to talk about this with any of our listeners on Twitter or. Yeah, absolutely. We yeah, for sure. We have limited time. Yeah. And, and I think that at least we put a pin in it right now of of now we get a much better sense of what's happening, what's going on. Now this conversation can be had out in the open and all the evidence can be weighed by the people involved and we can see how this is going to turn out and it can be done in the public. And I think that's better. And in the end, I think NASA is going to be glad that this conversation was brought out to light and it was had so that all the stakeholders can have a proper conversation about it. And there can be a, an outcome that hopefully can, can make as many people as possible happy. Hopefully they do the right thing. Hopefully. All right, Leah. All right. Yeah. I think also just to add on to that, I think it's like so important that NASA be as transparent as possible and you know it's a privilege not a right to have a telescope named after you so you know i think that's an important ongoing conversation um but to kind of pivot a little bit um i have a cool story to talk about about neutron stars um which are magnetized which i think i actually also talked about last time i was on the show i talked about a different kind of magnetar and now i'm back with our uh neutron stars they <laughs> never get old as you can see in this uh, artist rendition. But basically, um, there's a really cool paper that came out um, a couple weeks ago, and this is a theory paper, so there's not actually any observations. I just wanna clarify that. Um, but they make some really interesting predictions about a potentially new type of neutron star. So just for like a little bit of background, um, if you have two neutron stars that merge um, in some sort of, like compact binary event, like GW170817, for example, um, normally with two neutron stars, they will, um, the combined total mass of uh, the remnant that they merge into will be greater than something called the TOV limit. And that's about 2.3 solar masses. And um, when that happens, the uh, remaining object collapses into a black hole. And we think that that's pretty much uh, the standard story when it comes to merging neutron stars. Um, so if you have 
neutron stars that are a couple solar masses. They're going to merge. They're going to become a black hole. And so um, there are some uh, uh, theorized ways with like rotational energy where you can have this process happen um, such that uh, it doesn't collapse right away. And uh, what these authors from Australia and Germany um, calculated in this uh, really nice uh, paper in Physical Review D is that um, there's another method for this to happen where the uh, merger remnant won't actually collapse right away. And that's with a very strong magnetic field. Um, hmm. So they found that basically if you have two neutron stars and they merge and somehow in the merger process, um, or if one of them already had a very strong magnetic field on the order of about 10 to the 17 Gauss. Um, and just for comparison, the sun has a magnetic field of, I believe, about one Gauss. So these are very, very um, strong magnetic fields here. And But in the range of what people talk about when they talk about magnetars. So it's a kind of reasonable assumption. Um, but the idea is that when this happens, the kind of magnetic pressure, if you will, um, is so great that it actually it can also withstand this collapse into a black hole um, for time scales on on the order of maybe like one to ten years, which on you know cosmic time scales and the life of these things is not that long, but for our purposes um, is pretty significant for our observations. And they also um, calculated um, some potential signatures of this type of event that would be actually distinct from other types of things. So, um, you know, theorists predicting things that we can actually observe is always good. Um, and so the idea is that um, when the merger happens because of uh, the, the magnetic activity, there would be um, potentially a gamma ray, uh, gamma ray burst that would be distinctive. Um, that one could look at and then a kind of associated x-ray emission like afterglow. And then similarly, um, when this uh, object eventually would collapse into a black hole, um, there would potentially be some fast radio bursts. Um, and so again, this is just theoretical predictions right now. Um, but they in kind of future telescopes and things like that, um, if I think last time I was talking about um, a weird uh, radio burst uh, event. So if you had more things like that, um, this could potentially be kind of a smoking gun for this type of observation. They were also talking about potential gravitational wave signatures that would be altered uh, because of the magnetic fields that one could look for to see uh, proof for this type of object. Um, so it would be like a kilonova event. Right. Like when those two neutron stars collide with each other. But you and maybe you would get a different gravitational wave signature but then you would also potentially get a different visual appearance in the electromagnetic spectrum mm -hmm. that would look more similar to like a gamma ray burst than the kilonova event did yeah exactly which was like like they're like they're a lot shorter right like a short gamma ray burst yeah yeah, and so, there would be some um, kind of correlation between a gamma ray burst and then there would be some X-ray emission as well that I think would be uh, unique to this type of event. So you like 10 years, you've got this thing that is the merging of two neutron stars, but it won't black hole. Mm -hmm. What What is it? So they call it a magnetically supermassive neutron star. So it is still a neutron star, but it's just um, a unusually massive one um, right. because it has this kind of extra magnetic kind of energy uh, um, in in opposition to the gravity. Do they, do they speculate at all about what this would look like in gravitational waves? You know, we're seeing more of those sorts of events mapped out in, in gravitational waves now. Yeah, so they, they only commented on this like very briefly in the actual paper, but based on just like knowing how kind of gravitational waves work, um, my understanding is that if you have some um, really strong kind of magnetic signature like this, um, it would potentially alter the waveform um, that you would see for the gravitational wave coming in um, that you could kind of compare with like your GR waveforms. Um, I guess this is still in GR, but your standard, I work on modern gravity so that's where my mind goes um but the, your kind of standard um you know what it would look like for a normal 
um, non-magnetic event like this, but you could potentially see um, some distinctive emission. And they say that that could even be uh, accessible with advanced LIGO, which is the next um, the next LIGO upgrade. Um, now you I'm mentioned that- a cosmic thud. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you you mentioned that they would potentially give off a fast radio burst when it actually does that final collapse. So why a fast radio burst and not? Because it feels like it's still a tremendous amount of energy when it's making that final collapse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think this has something to do with somehow when the collapse spins, right? You have all this kind of magnetic energy that's all of a sudden kind of getting, I guess, for lack of a better word, kind of like cut off from the source right. as everything collapses. And that kind of somehow um, leads to this radio emission. So does this explain fast radio bursts? Not necessarily. Um, I think it could be interesting if, you know, there were more observations down the road. This paper just came out like a, two weeks ago or something. So um, if there were more observations that could be matched up with this type of event, that would be really cool. That might, you know, account for some of them. But I think, for now, there's no kind of distinctive evidence that this is what's causing right. fast radio bursts in general. But it would explain why they're they're happening in random locations, usually just right. one time, and then that's it. And that would yes, be... this would definitely be like a reasonable explanation for that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Although it would mean that it's happening a lot, which is, yeah. which would be really weird. So yeah, that would um... be a lot of you know very intense of these magnetic neutron stars, which would be cool. But yeah, very strange for there to be so many. Super interesting. Um, well, thank you so much for that. All right. Well, we've reached the end of our hour. So I want to give my co-hosts their chance to shamelessly self-promote what it is that they're working on. Kimberly, what are you working on? And where can people find out more? More Kimberly. She just puts up a question mark. That's I her answer. I don't know if I... You're back. Okay. Am I back? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You all disappeared. And apparently I disappeared too. Um, I've been working on a story... Uh, recently about how Mars's dust cycle controls its polar vortex, how much it snows, which is awesome. Um, and also about how the uh, size and frequency of wildfires in the U.S. has grown dramatically in the past 20 years, which is not so awesome. Um, also and al Canada. Also Canada. Um, and people can read all about that on eos.org. And follow me on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier. Fantastic. Morgan. Oh my gosh. I've like upended my life since the last time I was on, on the show. Uh, a new job, new city. Uh, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I moved to Nashville. Uh, so I could take a new job as the director of exhibits and planetarium at the Adventure Science Center here. Oh, so that's I'm really cool. just finished day four of the job. I'm ready to go sleep. Um, but uh, if you're in the part of the country around Tennessee, you should definitely uh, come by and say hi. It's uh, we got a lot of cool stuff. G give us an example. What's the cool? What is the coolest thing that you've got? Oh, what's the coolest thing that we got? Uh, I have to say, and this is appropriate for this show, we have a great planetarium. And what's really cool is the architecture, because there's windows around the lobby of the planetarium. And each one of them, it's like a Stonehenge. Each one aligns with a specific astronomical event. So it's like on the sunrise of the equinox, the sun will come in this window. And on, you know, oh. various astronomical events, you can stand in different places and see, be looking exactly in the right direction to see the thing happen. And you got to come at the right time, but it, it's, it's pretty cool that there's just so many of them kind of lined up in, in the uh, area around the theater. That's really cool. Uh, Leah? Yeah, so I am basically just in a mad rush to put the finish, finishing touches on my thesis. So next time I'm on the show, I'll be Dr. Leah, hopefully. Um. <laughs> it turns out it's it really is like the final step in the doctoral finishing process is you do a stint, a tour of duty on the <laughs> weekly space hangout, and then the then your then your degree arrives. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. So um, yeah, that's basically all I've been doing. So hopefully my life will be more interesting uh, afterwards. But if people want to follow your work, where should they go? Oh, yeah. Um, you can find me at my website, which is just leahjanks.com or on Twitter, which is at Leah G. Jenks. Perfect. Awesome. And Justin, you are a special guest. 
you get another another crack now. So if people want to follow your work, what's the best way to do it? Yeah, and with live video this time. Uh, yeah, so issarchaeology.org is our website, blog there with lots of information about our stuff, and then at ISS Archaeology on Twitter. And I'm at JSTP Walsh. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us this week for the Weekly Space Hangout. Thanks to all of my co-hosts, our special guest, who gets to hear me. Thank Normally they've gone, they're long gone, but this is great. Thanks to uh, everyone watching us both on YouTube and on Twitch. Appreciate it. Thanks to all the moderators who kept everything organized. Thanks to Pamela for engineering behind the scenes. And thanks as always to Nancy Graziano for organizing this whole herd of cats. Couldn't do this without you, Nancy. All right. We will see all of you next week. Thanks everyone. <laughs>